But anyway, ready or not, it's the title of my message. Ready or not, ready or not. Listen, John chapter 20, verse 23. Jesus has come to his disciples who are after the resurrection. Jesus comes to his disciples. He just comes in the room. He's just there. He appears in the room. And they're all in there shut in because they're afraid of the, the Jews after the resurrection. And so he comes in and he says in, in verse 23, he says, If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And that may just sound like something's odd there. That may sound like, but what he's saying is, is he begins to make a distinction. He begins to make some distinctions. Just like in Matthew, turn there, Matthew 16, in verse 18, he says that, he says, uh, and I say to you, he, he asked the disciples, this was before, he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And so some of them were saying, you're Elijah. Some of them saying, John the Baptist. And Peter, he just spouts out, you're the Christ. And he says, he, he goes on right here in verse 18. He says, I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, upon this rock of revelation, that I'm the Christ, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he's doing here, he did here the same thing that he's doing in John. He's making the distinction of heaven and earth, that God's kingdom has an earthly side. This is very important. Very, very important. Because this is the first time the word church is ever used. And the word church does not mean a building. <laughs> It does not mean that it's the place where the steeple is. The word church doesn't mean what we were taught in Sunday school. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open up and here's the people. That's totally opposite of what the church is. But yet that's what we've taught. Come on. The word church literally means a calling out, a popular meeting, especially religious congregation, assembly, church. Church means a point where action and motion come from. You become the point of motion and action where the kingdom of heaven comes from. Oh man, come on. You become the actual point of contact. You become the conduit of God Almighty of heaven. This is what Paul was saying. We are ambassadors of Christ. And Jesus again was making this statement saying, whoever you forgive, they're forgiven. Whoever you don't, whoever you retain, that word retain is power, strength. 
You have the power to hold in forgiveness or you have the power to release it. And if you release it, then it sets you free to go in motion and be the kingdom of heaven. But if you hang on to it, it's going to be rottenness to your bones. But you have the power to let go of it. You have the power to bring your emotions and your feelings into check and let go of that mess and not let the enemy who's been bound already, when you read that, the proper, the proper interpretation of that is having already been bound. Having already been loosened. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? All you have to do is come into agreement and alignment with the kingdom of God on what's already been bound and what's already been loosed. Eli is loosed healing over his ears because it was already done. We just have to come into alignment with it. Anybody in here? You get a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, then what you do is you stand on a rock holding a set of keys. And when you got keys, you got the authority to drive that anywhere it needs to go. Come on. If you ain't got the key or the fob, <laughs> come on, you ain't got nothing. Jesus said, I give you the keys. You don't have to get in some theological debate about this. He said, I give you the keys. I don't have to sit four years in cemetery to figure out I've got keys and be talked out of having those keys because it doesn't fit into your four-year program. Come on now. We're going somewhere this morning. <laughs> After Jesus' resurrection, there was a calling out there was a move. There was an awakening. There was a new church plant that had never been seen before as the body of Christ, as the church begins to come alive. There was a stirring in the wells, so to speak. There was something that happened, ready or not, it's here. Ready or not, it's here. It happened. It's done. It's been fulfilled. Ready or not, it's all come into alignment. And now, come on. See, it was strange and yet undeniable. Strange things happened. People were seeing... People out of graves, Moses, all of the patriarchs were walking around Jerusalem. People are being healed. People are being set free. Come on. Amen. There was something set in motion that was strange but yet undeniable. Come on. There was an awakening. There was something going on here that was supernatural. It was plowing through years, years of fallow, unproductive ground that had been laid waste by neglect. They had gotten caught up in the same old, same old, same old routines, the same old duties, the same old obligations. We're wore out after church. We're wore out after revival, after revival. Nothing's revived. We're just wore out. We put it on the sign. But come on. Just the same, same. And now all of a sudden, here comes this Jesus plowing through years and 
cultivating the ground. And he did this for you know three years. He plowed the ground and cultivated, and then he planted himself in it. And what sprang up was undeniable. He was the very seed for the church. Come on. When you take one seed, if all you ever see is one acre and you're missing the whole forest. And Jesus planted himself as the seed and then it sprang up and gave birth to this new awakening. Come on, man. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit after he planted himself and was resurrected, he sprouted up this new growth. All of a sudden, like spring comes on and you got to deal with it, ready or not. <laughs> ready or not, if your lawnmower ain't working, spring's coming, you better get that baby working. If that weed eater ain't running, you better go on and crank it because something's fixing to happen. Because something's happening. And you're going to have to start mowing, ready or not. Look in Acts chapter 6, and I'll start preaching. <laughs> oh, come to the altar. Father's arms are... Wow, was praise and worship off the chain or what? As always, As always yeah. <laughs> I just find it so refreshing after a long week to come in and just break it down, just worship. Man. Verse 1. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in... What? Disciples increased. You mean they all didn't die when those 12 died? Let's just take care of that while we're here. Huh? Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Helionistic Jews against the native he Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples, the congregation, a congregation of disciples, and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And this statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus guy, mm -hmm. Nick, Nick, Nick Nor. <laughs> Sounds like Nicorette, Nicorette, Timon, Parmius, Parmenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Now, here's the deal this church, this new awakening is coming out of the ground. There's no rules here. You, you know what I mean? There's, there's not any guidelines except we're going to follow the Holy Spirit and what He's doing. Now you can read this and you can say, wow, the apostles were kind of full of themselves, weren't they? They didn't want to take care of widows and orphans. They didn't want to be going to the hospitals all the time. They didn't want to be... Come on. But that's not what was going on here. What they did was, is they got together and they prayed to the Holy Spirit, what do we need to do? You got a lot of people sitting right out there 
that can do what you need. Here's the guidelines. Good reputation. Full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Come on. Th these were the guidelines. They didn't form a committee. And listen, Stephen's the only guy you ever really hear about in here, and he didn't make it very long. Nicholas, the only time you hear about Nicholas is in Revelations when Jesus says, I hate him. What? Y yeah. Jesus said, I hate the Nicolaitans because this proselyte, this new convert, what he did was is he worked out a compromise in the church. And Jesus said, I don't like compromise. And he compromised the faith and just allowed all other kind of doctrines to come in. I, I don't make, I, I'm just telling you what the word says. Come on. See, the disciples were increasing. There was very few guidelines for the assembling of the church. And out of that, helps ministry was birthed. And the reason I point that out is, is because we're in charge here. God trusts us to make some decisions. Even when somebody gets off course, that doesn't affect God. God's word still springs forth and went forth even when Nicholas got off track. Come on. And we make such a big deal about it, get all offended about it. When God's word is going to go forth, God will take care of that situation. Come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And so, look in verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace, oh, 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 oh full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Now, you just got to stop for a second. Because when you look up the word ministry, when Paul said, or when Peter said, we're going to devote ourselves to the ministry of the word, what that word ministry is and means is attendance like a waiter, a servant. There's, it, he wasn't saying we are more high and mighty. See, we <laughs> pastors get this thing. And I've sat in groups of pastors who have this, we're devoted to the word and prayer attitude. Come on, do y'all hear what I'm saying? And won't pick up a chair, won't clean a toilet, won't do... Come on. All he was saying is, look, we've got a different service of servant. And now, here is Stephen and it says, among the people. You know what he was doing? He was going house to house taking care of widows and orphans. And as he was out there in the community, the Holy Spirit and power would come on him and all these, uh, oh God, look. And some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Syrians and Alexandrians, and some from Sicily and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. And yet there were... they. I love it. And yet they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. He is out serving widows and orphans. And as he's doing that, he is telling them how they are set free. 
He has been put into action and motion when they would assemble and he would go out and he would begin to relate what he had begun hearing from the disciples. Come on. And he, listen, he was moving and working outside the body and all the scribes and Pharisees who were still locked up under law were having a hard time dealing with he wasn't doing all his duties and obligations in the temple. Amen. Come on, man. And heaven is backing him up. Heaven is moving on those who need to be healed moving on those who need to be set free. And they are having a hard time dealing with all of what this waiter is doing. This guy, the first Uber Eats. Let me just bring this up to 2022. Oh, Uber Eats is going around delivering, setting people free, laying hands on the sick, baptized. He is, he is in motion and taking action. And he is, his whole community is, and I mean, they are just increasing by the thousands. Come on, man. Years. Years, good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, character. See, is there any visible evidence that they're faithful, kind, learning, committed, patient, self-controlled? See, that's what a disciple is. He is committed to learning. A disciple is committing to experience and understand and to, come on, to learn. Being teachable. He's learning. Look in verse 13. Now all these religious cats got together. And they put forward, verse 13, false witness, false witnesses who said this man in consistently speaks against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and altar, the custom which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Oh. Stephen is being accused of coming against the law of Moses and the customs that were put forth by Moses. And all of a sudden, he is brought before the council. Listen, let me just say this. Your good reputation is going to be marred when you start walking in the power of the Holy Ghost amongst the religious folks. Because the religious folks are not going to know how to handle you. Come on. Because most time, people just want to justify their actions. So don't get upset if your good reputation is brought before a council. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because here, Stephen, and this is what, I, it, it just fascinated me. They are bringing charges against him 
for being against the law of Moses. And there, he is before the council. And all of a sudden, a hush, a pause, an awe comes into the room. And they're seeing Stephen's face shine like the face of Moses when he come off the mountain full of the glory of God. And the very thing that they're accusing him of, of being against, is on him. And yet they still pushed. And they're seeing it. For the first time, they've heard about it. They've read about it. Now they're seeing it and they don't even understand what's going on because this new move is so unconventional. This new awakening, this new thing that's happening, it goes against all their old doctrines and traditions. Paul called it traditions of men and doctrines of demons. And if you don't think in a 2,000 years the devil can't come up with some doctrines of demons, let me tell you something. He can. Some traditions of men. There's some things that are not heaven and hell issues, but we make them issues. And we gripe about it and we go back and forth about it. Listen, once saved, always saved. What? You can walk away from God. Can't wear makeup. Got to wear your hair and bun. Put on. Can't wear pants. Can't shave your legs. Please, girls, shave your legs. <laughs> got to go to a priest. You got to sit in a booth. You got to light a candle. We got all these things. And Stephen is out there going, hey, we ain't got to do all those things anymore. Jesus fulfilled the law. Now, it's okay if you want to go to church, but all that, I, I'm doing it out here. Oh, what? Because the temple is me now. Because I am the representative of heaven here on earth now. Come on, are y'all with me? Individually. Mm. See, we have to understand that Stephen has been stirring the pot. He's the spoon. Spoon. Did y'all watch Ultimate Cowboy over there? Raise your hand, spoon. Come on. I was proud of him. He just broke it right down, didn't he? Hey. <laughs> oh, man. If y'all ain't watching Ultimate Cowboy, it's on Inspire TV. Our boy Coy whoop, whoop, is stirring the pot. He probably doesn't want me announcing that, but every Thursday night. <laughs> We have watch parties now. <laughs> oh, man. That's so funny. Stephen was stirring the pot. Just like Elijah. Bringing correction and order. Just like where we're at today. God's bringing correction and order. And let me tell you something. This ain't a popular message. Because what it does is it puts a demand on us as individuals to be the church. And not just let this pastor guy do everything. I can't tell you how many churches, deacons run off, people get offended because the pastor can't be everywhere all at the same time. Well, you didn't come see me. You didn't come call me. You didn't come this. You didn't come that. What? My God. If you need help, bring your gloves, rubber boots, or whatever, and come to the house. 
You need counseling? Come see me. We're going to work and we're going to counsel. Well, I want to come sit in your air-conditioned office. I ain't there. Come on. I'm serious. We're going we're, we're gonna to do something. Josh has got plenty to do. Josh can counsel you. He's like, no. It'll be short and it will be sweet. It'll be good. Short, sweet. <laughs> Come on now. Isaiah 66. Let me show you something. Let me show you something profound. Verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? Where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Now here's what you have to understand. For 53 verses... 53 verses. This uneducated waiter, O Uber Eats, begins to go from Abraham all the way to Jesus. And he begins to show them that the gospel, the revelations that God gave Abraham wasn't in a temple. Matter of fact, Abraham wasn't even in the promised land when the revelation came that he was going to be the father of many nations. Come on. So God made the earth and it's his footstool. Come on. He can do whatever he wants. And then Stephen goes to schooling them, telling them God tried to send messengers to you to tell you, and you killed them, you stiff neck. Uh oh. Come on. That's what Coy said I'm the big spoon in a little pot. Stephen was a big spoon in a little pot. And Mr. Man, they came at him. <laughs> Look in verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. <laughs> the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. I will send survivors from them to the nations, Tarshish, Put, Lud, Rosh, Tubal, Javan, to the distant coastlands that have never heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they will declare my glory among the nations. In other words, they will shine. Here's what's interesting. Stephen was a Hellenistic Jew. In other words, he was a Grecian. From Greek. I had to look it up, Luke. Luke had the same look I had on my face. He was from Greek. He was from Greece. What, where, where, Greek. He was Greek. He spoke Greek. <laughs> and back in Acts, it says, from the synagogue of the freed men. Now, when they were all sent into exile, they were scattered abroad. The Jews that went were scattered in Greece and came back were considered freed men. In other words, they were Jews that were slaves but now are free. Oh, man. 
So Stephen was a Jew who spoke Greek. The whole New Testament is wrote in Greek. And when Stephen was standing there, he was a sign of God's glory. Come on, man. Reflecting the kingdom of God. And that word glory is weight. It's heavy. You got to deal with it. And here these priests and these Pharisees are having to deal with the glory of God. And it is heavy on them. Come on now. Are y'all with me? The point here is that change is never comfortable. It's not always easy and it goes against traditions, doctrines, and it's a lot of sacred and family traditions. It's heavy. The glory of God is heavy. It can be weighty at times. But if you are willing to come into alignment with it, it will reflect off of you and it will shine. Come on. Look in Joel chapter 3. And I'll close with this. Stephen was saying, the law's been fulfilled, guys. You're free. He tells them, quit resisting the Holy Spirit. You stiff-necked people. Let me tell you something. Since I was a little boy, I remember growing up in a church that resisted the Holy Spirit. I mean, resisted. Ready or not, we're going to have to deal with some things. Joel, this is after the promise of the Spirit, of the outpouring. Joel in chapter 2 and 28 says, And it will come about after this, I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind, and on your sons and on your daughters. And Peter makes that statement when everybody thought they were drunk. And he comes out, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God is just moving, ready or not. It's co- He's here. We have to deal with it. We, got, we either get in line or we don't. And so now, Joel comes in chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, this is right after he says that, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, let me just stop right there. When I will restore the fortunes. He says, I will restore. I will return. I will return on my people. My covenant people. I will return the fortunes. In other words, I will return you back to the prosperity in the way you're supposed to be. We've had such a resistance of the Holy Spirit that we can't even receive prosperity that He is restoring. Who would you rather have money? You or Joe Biden? You or Hunter Biden? Who would you want to be in charge of millions of dollars? You or Joe Biden? Do I need to make that any more clearer or plainer? Who? I would rather be in charge of it so we could go do what the church needs to do. So that we can go 
and inspire people. Not because we got money. But because when we go somewhere, we do it in excellence. And we usher in and we reflect the glory of God. And that brings in the anointing which sets captives free, that heals them, gets them saved, and then the deliverance, the burden removing. Come on, do you hear what I'm saying? And increasing disciples because they are inspired, not because we took a vow of poverty and walk around in our phylacteries and say, oh God, and hope that gets a response. <laughs> Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's the funniest thing sitting in pastor meetings because when you ask one to pray, buddy, it gets holy. Dear Lord God. What? Lord God. <laughs> Won't you? <laughs> Won't you? Come by one more time. Stop, she said. Moving along. I'm just saying, we can work ourselves up into a frenzy. I will gather all the nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided up my land. Remember, the earth is mine and the fullness, God said. And they have cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Mm. Look at verse 5. Since you have taken my silver and my gold, brought my precious treasures to your temples, <laughs> robbed God to furnish their own temples, and sold the sons of Judah in Jerusalem to the Greeks, uh-oh, there it is, in order to remove them far from their territory. Behold, I'm going to arouse them. I would say to venture, Stephen was aroused. That was that spoon. I'm going to arouse them from the place where you have sold them and return your recompense on your head. Here's what I'm telling you. We're living in a day where you're going to stir the pot because you just don't, you stepped out of the box. Come on. And when you step out of the box and you start believing that nothing is impossible with God, and then you begin to speak to the fortunes. Come on. Lord, I thank you that you're restoring my household. I thank you that you're restoring my family in its rightful place. All you mothers who have laid your kids on the altar, who have prayed tears and years, I'm telling you right now to start thanking God and being grateful because they're coming back. They're coming back. They can't resist it any longer because you're going to put the recompense on the devil's head and tell him to let go of your kids. That they start seeing that a veil be removed, that you're, oh man, that the reflection of the kingdom of God, they'll be able to see it. Come on, man. What do you need to be speaking to? God says, I will restore Store all of it back. Amen. The resurrection was about restoration. It wasn't about having to go through the dreads of life. Come on. How many times do you miss how beautiful this earth really is that God created? Because of all the crap that's going on. How many times 
do we not see the sun when it's rising? Or going down and God paints that painting that only He can paint. You can't even capture it on your little phone. How beautiful a sunset is. How many times do we miss the beauty of God all around us because we forget that He's restored. And we don't have to walk around in the mully grubs. We can start thanking Him for those healings. Start being grateful Are you ready? Because it's our time. It's our time. Yes, it is. It's my time. I'm going to say it right now. It's my time. Amen, brother. It's my time. Come on, if you stand, come on, stand. Come on, it's my time. Wake up every morning. It's my time. It's my time to see the healing. It's my time to see the restoration. It's my time to experience joy. Come on, when's the last time you experienced joy? It's my time. It's my time. <laughs> it was so funny. This morning we all we, we went to Josh and Keisha's because Josh and Keisha and Coy last night, they went to get hay, but they also went to get up to Oklahoma to get puppies. And we were over there. And when, and the kids didn't know. And they were at Bubbles and Marvin's last night. Well, they come home this morning. We were over there. And the joy on their face. I mean, we got some old dogs. But we ain't got no puppies. And the joy on their face. Wait, what? This is ours? We get to keep this? Scylla didn't say a word. She just ran over to Keisha and hugged her. Come on. Come on, it's, it's starting to sink in. That's what being a Christian, that's what made Stephen... Stir the pot. It's because every time he woke up and he began to minister to the widows and the orphans and share the gospel, it became like getting a new puppy every day. How often do we lose that? We lose the sunset. We lose the sunrise. We lose the calf skipping around. And we lose that freshness of being turned out to pasture. Oh, man, two bull, Metallica and Yellowtail were out yesterday. <laughs> oh, God. And, and it was something that just being, look, they were right up against the fence, but being on that side of the fence when me and Wendy were pinning them, they were just, they were, it was like they were free. Yeah. Come on. Just being this far over. Yeah. And I thought, oh God, they're going to put the run treatment on us. And they're bucking and they're running around. And, and I was like, Lord, just let them hit that hole down there. And meant they bucked right through it. <laughs> I was like, I praise God. I ain't got time for them to be out gallivanting through the woods. <laughs> yeah, well, there was another one out at three this morning when I got up, but he was least in the pens. 
Look, this far, one step sometimes is all it takes to be free. One step. Sometimes we just got to get out of our religious, reasonable mind box. God, what do you want this morning? Lord, restore the fortunes. Lord, restore my house. Listen, it's not about money. It's about wholeness. It's about being whole. It's about peace. It's about joy. Come on, what attitudes, what mentality needs to be broke and changed in your life? To say, God, I'm not going to put myself in that box, but I'm going to... I always hate when people people go, oh, you got God in a box. Let me tell you something. You can't put God in a box. You are in the box. How do you put God in a box? Oh, we've got God's hands tied. No, your mouth has got you tied. God set you free. Come on, Heather. Okay, I didn't want to interrupt, sorry. Um, so uh, about a week ago, the Lord gave me a word of faith versus expectations. Oh, come on. And I was like, where, where is this going? Because like, I know that my faith, like, I know, I know who you are, so I expect these things because you're not, you don't just do good, you are good. So, but then I started digging deeper into it, and I started thinking, and it lines up with today, um, Traditions are comfortable because we've Ooh. seen how they've followed out for the previous generation. We see how we expect how what's going to happen. And it's easy for the church to fall into that wow. tradition of, well, that's what they did. So that's what we're going to do because we know how it's going to happen. Wow, it's but good. God moves in our life through our faith. And when you have the faith Man, in him good. and who he is. Yes, your expectations might, you might hit them, you might surpass them, they might fall short, but he still is going to work everything out for the good. And the church, I feel like for so long has been stuck in that we're just more comfortable with with the traditions because we know the expectations of it. That's good. But it's faith. So I just wanted to say that. That's very good. That's very good. Man. That is so good because that's exactly what happens. We get comfortable in them, and that's what Stephen's point was. You got so hardened to your, and God always trying, when God comes to do a new thing, oh, come on. Wow. Absolutely. Because we never know. I'm telling you, I'll never forget when we were putting rodeos on, PRCA rodeos, and having a Christian concert in the middle of it. And it developed into where we were staying a day later to have church. Because it just grew. And it's just amazing to see what God did when we stepped out of the box. You don't have to be in a building to have church. And how God moved in the anointing, and it was amazing. God's doing new things. Ready or not, He's doing new things. Father, we come to You. And Lord, I thank you for the new things. Lord, help us to see how to navigate through what's going on in our day and time. Lord, help us to come in alignment with the kingdom of heaven that we may bring it here on earth. To be able to set the captives free. 
to help restore joy. The good news that people need to hear. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory for everything that you're doing in our day. And we look forward, Father, to be a place where we can gather and then be put into action. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love y'all. We'll see you Wednesday night.